All right. Okay. I'm really grateful to be here with you guys. Um, I've been kind of looking forward to, but also petrified of this moment uh, for the year and a half that I've been in seminary. <laughs> I think that it's one of those things you know that you've got to take the homiletics course. So the idea of, of getting to the point where you're preaching in front of students with whom I've been in classes this whole time. I mean, we've all learned the same information. We've all taken the epistles class. We've all done this together. And so the idea of offering new information about James to a bunch of seminary students and a professor is, is absolutely terrifying. But I think the beauty of God's Word and what I hope we remember today and my prayer for all of us is that, that it's fresh, that we look at this with, with fresh eyes and fresh ears and fresh minds to hear what God has to say through James in this passage. Because the faith and works passage in James that we're about to get into is one that has, has thrown people off for centuries. Martin Luther called this entire letter an epistle of straw. So as we get started, as I read this passage and we pray together, my prayer is that we look at this with fresh eyes. So if you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to read from James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, Without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, and you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone, and in the same way was not Rahab the prostitute also justified by words when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Let's pray together. Father God, um, as we come before you, Lord, with this incredibly challenging text, I pray that for all of us, we would, we would look at this, as we said before, with eyes that are open to what you have to say, with ears that are open to what you have to say, with minds that can understand this anew. Father, your, your word is living and active. I pray that it, would, that it would pour into our hearts. God, I ask that you would use me, that I would be but an instrument for your glory, for your kingdom. Father, that you would remove me from this and speak your truth to all of us today. And I pray this in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. So a couple weeks ago, I was at an Acts 29 conference, um, which if you know anything about the Acts 29 network, means that I was in a room with a bunch of guys that looked exactly like me. There was a lot of facial hair, there was a lot of thick rim glasses, and there was a lot of plaid. So I felt really comfortable while I entered into the room. But there was a speaker there named James K. Smith. You may have read some of his stuff. Um, he recently just put out a book called How Not to Be Secular. And he was kind of speaking on that book. And one of the things that he was saying was that if we want to understand culture, if we want to understand the culture in which we live, if we want to be what he called ethnologists, then we need to stop spending all of our time reading their documents, and we need to begin to read their lives. So in the secular age, when we think of secularism, maybe you've heard of, of Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris. These guys are called the New Atheists. If we read all of their works, then what we're going to think is that everyone who is secular thinks that God does not exist. And what James K. Smith was trying to argue, and I think he did it well, was that if, if we're really going to understand secularism, then we have to start looking at how the average secular person lives their lives. What they spend their money on, what they spend their time pursuing, what their hobbies are, what their jobs are geared towards. And what we will begin to see is that postmodern secular people are striving and searching for something spiritual. They're searching for something more. Maybe they don't believe in the God of the universe. But they're searching for something to fill that void within them. And we only would be able to tell that if we truly look at how they live their lives. 
And as I was sitting there, and that was hitting home with me, that argument got flipped on its head in my own life. If I am a Christian, if a secular person were to look at my life and look at how I spend my time and my money and my energy, would it point them to the reality that I worship and desire most in the world the God of the universe? Or would it point them to the reality that what I am worshiping and what I am desiring and what I, I, I am putting all of my energy into is just myself? Do I desire most security? Do I desire most to be liked by other people? Or do I desire most to see God's kingdom grow? To see men and women who do not know the hope of the gospel come face to face with Jesus Christ? Does my life tell that story? That is what James is getting into, not just in the passage that we just read, but in the entirety of his letter. From the, from the end of chapter 1 where he says, listen, if you have the implanted word inside you, if you have the word of God and you've received it inside you, then don't just hear that word, do it. Act it out. Live it. And he goes on to say, pure religion is, is caring for orphans and widows in their affliction. Visiting orphans and widows in their affliction. Verse 27 of chapter 1. And everything builds from there. What Todd just spoke on is great. He did an awesome job, but it doesn't matter without verses 14 through 26 in chapter 2. If you're going to show partiality, you're not living out your faith. James's whole argument is, is founded upon this idea that if we're not living out our faith, if our lives, everything that we do, our actions do not reflect our holding to this faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, then it means nothing. It's not useful. This letter, because, because so many of us have spent so much time studying Paul, it gets a bad rap. Because we look at it and we say, listen, he uses the word like justification, he uses faith, he uses works, but he's using them differently. As Steve just indicated a little bit earlier, he was, he was probably writing earlier than Paul. But they're not contradicting each other. What James is pointing out is that it, it, if we are truly faithful to Christ, then our lives will reflect that. Trusting in Christ means living for him. Yeah, yeah. They are inseparable. And I love this about James because I feel like he's that voice in our head saying the thing that we are most afraid is true. That we as seminarians, we sit together and we spend all of our days and our weekends and many of our nights and all the hours in between talking about, thinking about God. And we're not actually living it out. I think that terrifies us. It's easy to talk about him when you're around a bunch of Christians. It is absolutely terrifying to live out what we're talking about. Um, have, have any of you seen the show Parenthood? Okay, it's a fantastic show. All the seasons are on Netflix, just in case you're interested. <laughs> but uh, there's a character. There's a character on that show named Max, who they find out. Max, they find out in early on in season one, has Asperger's. He has autism. Um, and so he's got some behavioral issues for sure, but I love Max. He's one of my favorite characters because he has absolutely zero filter. I mean, he does not hold back anything. And everything he says is true, but he always says the thing that nobody else wants to acknowledge. So his sister Hattie um, has an African-American boyfriend named Alex. Alex comes over to the house to meet the parents and everything, and he walks in the door, and Max takes one look at him, and it's not, hey, what's up? My name's Max. It's, you're black. That's all he says. Statement of fact, but no less uncomfortable because we, that, that just makes us churn inside. It's not politically correct. Later on, he's hanging out with Alex at Hattie's school, and somebody invites Alex to a party where there's going to be alcohol, and unbeknownst to the person who invited him, Alex is an alcoholic because he was raised in a really rough home, and he saw that his father drank all the time, and so he clung to that. And then Max is standing there, and he looks at Alex, and he looks at the person who invites him, and he goes, no, this guy's an alcoholic. That's probably a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the kind of thing where, where we, truth makes us uncomfortable for whatever reason. And that's, that's James's voice. That's James's voice. We don't want to hear it. But he says it from the beginning of this passage, the first three verses. What good is it, my brother, if someone says he has faith, if someone claims to have faith, if he does not have works? Is that type of faith. And in the Greek here, there's an article that refers back to that hollow faith that claims faith but doesn't have works. Is that kind of faith able to save him? 
And the implied answer to that is absolutely not. You cannot separate your confession of faith in the glorious Lord Jesus Christ, which he mentions back in, in chapter 2, verse 1. You cannot separate a holding to that faith, a confession of that faith, from the way that you live your lives. And another word that we need to look at is the word good. We read this and our eyes gloss right over. What good is it, my brothers? We don't think about what the word good means for most of us. But when we think of good, we think of good versus bad. It's almost like a moral thing. Is it a good faith or is it a bad faith? But the word in Greek, aphelos, is not, it's not asking if it's good in that way. It's asking if it's useful. What use is faith? What benefit is faith? What gain is faith if it is not lived out in works of mercy? He's not asking, is your faith good or is it bad? He's asking, is it useful or is it useless? If your faith is not outward looking, it's useless. It's not good for anyone. I, um, I'm going to use an example of homelessness as well. I was thinking about this. Um, I, if you guys commute in, everybody has an intersection that they just hate. There's always an intersection where you can never catch a green light no matter how hard you try. So Mississippi and Santa Fe, if you're going south in Santa Fe, I hit that red light every stinking time. And I've tried everything. I've tried the slow roll, where you slow roll up to the light to see if you can just keep it just long enough to where you don't have to stop. Never works. I always hit the light. I try to go really fast if I see that it's green and it always turns red. I'm like the first car at that intersection that stops me. I mean, it doesn't work. But, but there's, a, there's consistently, and interestingly, he wasn't there today for whatever reason, but there's consistently a homeless man who is standing at that intersection. And I roll up to that intersection, and I, you know, I've got my, my butt warmers on, I've got my warm car, I've got my down jacket, I've got my hot coffee, I've got my food for the day because I never leave this place. <laughs> and there's this homeless man, and he's just, he's just standing there. And what am I trying to do? Much like Todd Express, I'm trying to avoid eye contact with him the entire time. I mean, how many of us have been at intersections in Denver where it's like, and we're just kind of, you know, what? We are consistently trying to avoid eye contact with people like this because it makes us uncomfortable. But I, I was thinking, what, you know, as James is expressing this in verses 15 and 16, what good would it be if I rolled down my window and he's got a sign that says, hey, I need food or I need money, and I was just like, hey, good luck, buddy. You'll do great. And I rolled the window back up. Or I even rolled the window down and said, hey, there's a McDonald's like five feet that way. You should just go there. But he doesn't have any money. James says, if a brother or sister, this is verse 15, is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? It's about as good as my telling that guy, good luck, without offering any kind of assistance. It, hollow words are words that are not followed up with action. If I say to that guy, I love you, but I don't walk with him to go get him a meal, or I don't even roll down the window and just ask him his name. What good is that? It's a hollow word, and it's a hollow faith. And it, it, was just, it was all the more convicting because I was studying James. Because I'm sitting at this intersection, and I'm trying to avoid eye contact with, with this guy, and I'm heavily caffeinated because I'm drinking my hot coffee. And I'm thinking, what, what good is my faith in this moment? What does the fact that I am a Christian mean for, for this guy right now. I can sit here in my car all day and, and think about all of the tests I have that are about Jesus. And yet my relationship with Christ is not informed how I'm treating this guy because I don't want to look at him. Because I don't want him to inconvenience me. And it's all the excuses are running through my mind. Everything that you mentioned, everything. I mean, he's probably, if I give him money, it's going to go to alcohol. If I, if I, you know, he's probably got a job and he's just here or because he's lazy or he's not really homeless. He just wants a little extra cash. The worst one that I came up with was um, if I give him my food, I'm going to have to buy food. And doesn't this guy understand that I'm in seminary? <laughs> doesn't he understand that I'm poor in my hot car with my hot coffee? That was, that was the, the scathing reality and I couldn't escape James's voice in my head. What good is your faith if it's not lived out? What good is your faith if it's not presented in works? That's a, that is a challenging reality. We cannot separate faith from works. And he sums it all up in verse 17. 
So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. He's already presented his main argument. And I, I almost feel bad because, I mean, James is hammering the same point home throughout this passage. It doesn't stray from the fact that faith, apart from works, is useless. But, and James brings this up, what if there's always going to be people who say you can separate them? Look at what he asks in verse 18. Someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he says, show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. That objection you could put into the voice of any postmodern millennial in this day and age. Listen, what works for you is good, but what works for me is good too. You've got the faith thing, and that's awesome, but I'm just going to try to be a good person. I had so many high school students tell me that. Like, I love, you're talking to me about Jesus, that's fantastic. But I, I'm just trying to be a good person, I don't really need that. But there's a guy named Scott McKnight, and he looks at this passage and he says, what if, what if, this isn't just one person describing two different situations, what if it's one person who's saying, listen, I have works and I have faith, but they don't interact. They're just two parts of who I am. I've got my faith in Christ and I've got 